How did they do it? How did they overcome the vicious racial hatred, the loss of their constitutional rights, the forced surrender of their goods, their property, of all that they had worked for, their families being herded into prison camps, the injustice, the abuse, and then to be denied full recognition for the fight they had won. How did they do it? After the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, my country didn't trust me. Although I thought I was patriotic and American-born citizen, the United States government classified me and other Japanese Americans as enemy aliens. I was 17 years old, and I wanted to fight for my country. But Japanese Americans were considered unfit for service. We petitioned the government to allow us to serve in uniform. And finally, because the army needed men and winning them all wasn't a foregone conclusion at that time, we were permitted to do so. We became members of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which was my unit the 100th Infantry Battalion and the Military Intelligence Service. Like no other group of fighting men in our nation's history, we had to prove our loyalty, even if many of us had to die proving it. We had to go for broke. America was, and still is, peopled by immigrants. Give me your tired, your poor, cried Miss Liberty, your huddled masses yearning to be free. But in the 19th and early 20th centuries, there were public outcries over dumping Europe's garbage at the feet of the Statue of Liberty. Hopeful immigrants were dubbed Wops, Kikes, Bohunks, Polacks, but they were white Europeans, and in a few generations, they blended in with the American blue bloods. Give me your tired, your poor, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. On the West Coast, that teeming shore was Asia. Long before the Golden Gate Bridge was built, Asian immigrants were arriving at Bay Area ports and the ports of Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle. Shiploads of Chinese were brought over to build the Transcontinental Railroad. Japanese immigrants followed to work the farms and orchards of the fertile valleys of California and Oregon. They were dubbed Japs, a term of contempt. Unlike European immigrants, Asians were never integrated into the overall U.S. population. They looked different. Instead, an alarmed white citizenry saw Asians as a threatening yellow peril. California and other states passed laws forbidding interracial marriage. In 1911, the Bureau of Immigration decreed that Asians could not become U.S. citizens on the basis of race. In 1913, California's alien land law prohibited Asian immigrants from owning land. In San Francisco and Berkeley, there was a movement to prohibit Japanese American children from attending public schools. It is ironic that the heroes of the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team could grow out of this climate of hate. Eighteen sixty eight saw the beginning of Japanese immigration when a ship set sail from Yokohama carrying a hundred and fifty three immigrants bound for Hawaii. Unlike mainland Americans, Hawaiians were racially tolerant. After all, Hawaii was a kingdom then ruled by a Polynesian royal family. More Japanese would follow, many, many more boatloads. Immigrants from Japan are called Issei 
And like most immigrants to a new land, the Issei clung to the old ways. Sugarcane was the core of Hawaii's economy. As the need for field hands increased, recruiters combed the world for cheap labor. Soon the cane fields were being worked by mounting numbers of Japanese, 10, 12 hours a day for $30 a month. The good jobs, like overseers, went to Americans, the English, and the Scots. Not all who toiled in the fields were Japanese. There were Chinese and Koreans, Filipinos, Portuguese, and Puerto Ricans. Since each immigrant group couldn't understand the language of the others, they learned to communicate, in the catch-all jargon of the islands, a crazy quilt of English, Hawaiian, Japanese, Chinese, and South Sea sailor talk known as pigeon. I know Tavi good man, bad man. I look eye, look mouth, then I Tavi. More better. It was this wonderfully laid back lingo that threatened the unity of Hawaii's Nisei and the mainland Nisei while they were being melded into the 442nd combat team. The team came close to being no team whatsoever. Nisei, the first generation born on the U.S. mainland or in the territory of Hawaii, enjoyed United States citizenship as a birthright. At home, the Nisei grew up in the tradition of Japanese values. Some Issei parents sent their sons to Japan to finish off their education. This became significant after the U.S. entered World War II. Nisei who studied in Japan were called Kibei. By the 1920s, Japanese language newspapers in Hawaii were urging their readers to concentrate on Hawaii, not on Japan. In Hawaii as well as the West Coast, the Nisei were growing up apple pie American. They went in for sports, excelled at academics, in Honolulu, McKinley High School became known as Tokyo High. Island Nisei learned to play the ukulele from the Hawaiians and sing Hawaiian songs. Faith, hope, and charity. My dad would play the flute, you know, the Japanese uh, bamboo flute. He, she, he played that. But, you know, I, I tend to see not to sing Japanese song. I didn't like Japanese song. I, I, I felt that Japanese song is it's just about the same. Every, every tune is just about the same, you know. So I, it, it doesn't excite me singing Japanese song. So I learned Hawaiian song. Nisei loyalties were to the stars and stripes. Still, these Japanese Americans were objects of distrust. That distrust was growing because of Japan itself, militarism, wars of conquest, tension between Japan and the United States strained to the snapping point. Then, December 7, 1941. The naval base at Pearl Harbor on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. A sleepy Sunday morning. Uh, I was on a big tugboat. And we were already out working that morning. We had a job. We were meeting a ship coming in to take a barge away from it. So we were all awake and uh, down the channel there behind me. And uh, this flight of planes came over that mountain range over there. On the mainland, Americans were listening to the CBS Sunday broadcast of the New York Philharmonic. This program to bring you a special news bulletin. Announcer came on the air, cut off the music, and he literally started to shout and yell, Pearl Harbor is being bombed. I saw a dive bomber come from the Honolulu direction 
and hit into the Arizona uh, battleship roll. And I saw them, I saw the pilot drop this torpedo. And instead of going up where he can get hit by anti-aircraft, he hugged the surface of the water and came directly at me. And at that point, I was more interested in seeing the face of the pilot. I felt that my life had come to an end at that point because obviously uh, the pilot in that plane looked like me. America thrashed in shame and rage, shocked by its own vulnerability. And the fateful bombing of Pearl Harbor forever changed the lives of Japanese Americans. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. In its account of the attack, the Tulsa Daily World falsely reported that the Japanese had been carefully coached in such proceedings by the Germans. It was hard for white Americans to accept the fact that Asians could successfully conceive and execute so daring a military action. Most Americans were raging for revenge. Hawaii readied itself for an invasion. Martial law was declared. The FBI and local authorities began rounding up the Issei leadership of the Japanese community, which constituted a third of Hawaii's population. But there were no serious problems with persons of Japanese ancestry, neither the first nor second generation. No acts of sabotage whatsoever. Still, it was proposed that 100,000 Issei and Nisei be sent to the mainland or relocated to Molokai, an island known for its leper colony. On the mainland, West Coast Caucasians turned viciously on their 120,000 residents of Japanese ancestry, most of whom were American citizens. Although a spokesman for the Central Japanese Association in Los Angeles had firmly stated, our people are 100% loyal to America, hundreds of Japanese American community leaders were swept up by the police and held in custody with no formal charges, their families forbidden to see them. I also had a Chinese American friend, a good friend of mine, who came into my laboratory section with this big button on his shirt. You know, Chinese American, with the cross flags of China and the United States. I don't blame him, you know, I, I wouldn't want to take a chance on getting beaten up on the streets of Los Angeles at that time. Grocery stores barred them. Banks refused to cash their checks. Insurance companies canceled their policies. Their doctors were no longer allowed to practice. Three months after Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which directed the government to relocate for the duration of the war. Persons of Japanese ancestry were the aliens or American citizens in internment camps, a safe distance from strategic war facilities. Japanese Americans were no longer referred to as citizens. Now, they were non-aliens. General John L. DeWitt, head of the Western Defense Command, concurred. He declared, a Jap's a Jap. It makes no difference whether he's an American or not. Up and down the West Coast, families were forced out of their neighborhoods. They were given as little as 48 hours to sell their homes and shops, sometimes for as little as a nickel on a dollar. My parents lost their house, lost their car, lost everything but a few. Well, sold their things like everybody else, sold it for just nothing. For the evacuation, they were tagged like luggage and had no idea of where they were going. They soon found out. They were shipped first to improvised assembly centers. Often these were racetracks where they slept in horse stalls. If you know what a horse stall is, it's just a, probably a 10 foot wide, maybe a 20 feet deep, 
and it was just uh, kind of swept out, and it looked like it was kind of uh, painted uh, whitewash. But uh, of course, the orders were still there. From assembly centers, they were shipped to detention camps, which were located in remote areas of the country. In California, the camps were sited far inland, Manzanar and Tule Lake. Arizona also had two camps, Poston and Gila River. Topaz was in Utah, Minidoka in Idaho, Harp Mountain in Wyoming, Granada in Colorado, and Rower and Jerome were in Arkansas. These were the destinations of aliens and citizens alike. Jerry-built, unpaid, lacking in facilities. The camps were hardly set up to accommodate mothers with babies, small children, old people, sick people, the whole bewildered mass. You could hear people uh, crying, you can hear uh, uh, people talking. Uh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely no privacy at all. One thing the camps were not lacking was armed security, guard towers, barbed wire, fixed bayonets. Even President Roosevelt once referred to them as concentration camps. When you were thrown from a free life into a camp without a trial um, and just thrown in there by your government, uh, they have taken your freedom away from you. Okay, this is not like going into a jail and put behind, bob, uh, behind bars and having your freedom taken away from you. This is a freedom that is inside of you and the only way I can explain it is like somebody taking a knife and cutting your heart out. In Hawaii, common sense prevailed. There was no uprooting of families, no camps. The proposal to relocate the Issei and Nisei on Molokai never got through. Residents of Japanese descent pitched in with everyone else to help the war effort. The federal government was surprised to learn that the majority of Hawaii's National Guardsmen were Japanese Americans, of whom 317 were discharged and reclassified 4C. But then, all Nisei eligible for the draft were classified 4C, enemy alien. Still, the army was faced with the question what to do with the Nisei soldiers who had been drafted before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The people of Hawaii got behind the formation of an all-Japanese-American combat unit for the war in Europe. The Army agreed. In June of 1942, 1,432 soldiers of Japanese ancestry were segregated and then shipped from Honolulu to San Francisco. They formed the 100th Infantry Battalion separate. Separate meaning not attached to any other unit. That is militarily an orphan. They adopted this battalion insignia with one puka puka and took as their motto, remember Pearl Harbor. Then the 100th was transported by troop train to the Midwest for basic training. Their destination was a far cry from the beaches of Hawaii the northerly state of Wisconsin and Camp McCoy. This was probably the first time Hawaii's Nisei had ever set foot on the mainland, or had ever seen snow. After their training at McCoy, the army still didn't know what to do with them. So in January of 43, they shipped them to Camp Shelby in Mississippi for more training. Training was vigorous. Like the Nisei, young Ok Kim was Asian. But unlike the Japanese Americans, Kim was of Korean descent. Despite graduating second in his class at officer candidate school, Kim could hardly get an assignment. 
racial prejudice. In time, he was assigned to the 100th Infantry Battalion and reported to Colonel Turner at Camp Shelby. Farrah Turner came in and I reported uh, to him uh, reporting for duty, and he said, um, I'll have you transferred uh, um, immediately. And I said, well, I just got here. Why am I being transferred? He says, oh, I, in case you don't know, you know, the unit are, are Japanese and you're Korean, and coming from the islands, I know the Koreans and Japanese don't always get along. And so that's the reason. I said, no. I said, you're wrong. I said, they're Americans, and I'm American, and we're going to go fight for America. On August 21st, 1943, the 100th Infantry Battalion was shipped into the European theater of war. There was a feeling that since the 100th was made up of men of Japanese ancestry, it was somehow more expendable than a military unit of Caucasians, somehow a guinea pig battalion. Their baptism by fire took place at one of the most beautiful locales in Europe, the farthest reaches of the Amalfi Coast. It comes in the terrible fighting at Salerno. On the first day of combat, baseball star Shigeo Joe Takata was the first member of the 100th Infantry Battalion to be killed in action. The 100th was attached to General Mark Clark's 5th Army in its push to Rome. Clark's advance was halted at Monte Cassino on the Rapido River. Crowning the heights of a 1,700-foot hill was the most revered monastery in Europe going back to the 5th century of our era, the birthplace of Western monasticism. Historically, it was a shrine. Militarily, it was a Gibraltar. Now, instead of monks, it was occupied by the military, the enemy military. Manuscripts, relics, sculptures, paintings were safely stored. Then the Germans turned this ancient abbey into an impregnable fortress and a superb military observation post. They had dammed the Rapido River, flooded the surrounding valley like a moat. Thousands of mines had been set. And sharp-eyed German artillerymen fired at anything below with deadly accuracy. Crossing the valley under a smokescreen cover, B Company of the 100th Infantry Battalion began an assault during broad daylight. Then the wind changed. Suddenly, they were naked to enemy artillery. I had five officers and uh, 46 men. When I got across, when we went across, we ended up with three officers and 11 men. The rest of them were wounded or killed. As a last resort, it took 600 tons of bombs to flush the enemy from his stronghold. The abbey was destroyed. The Purple Heart Medal was instituted in 1782. It was, and still is, awarded to members of the armed forces of the United States who are combat wounded or killed in action, or die of wounds received in action. Back in Hawaii, the Issei, old country Japanese, began receiving purple hearts in the name of their sons. So many of these medals were awarded that now, the guinea pig battalion became known as the Purple Heart Battalion. Ever since Pearl Harbor, patriotic young men were eager to serve their country in the armed forces. Many volunteered. The less patriotic waited to be drafted. But the Nisei were still classified 4C, enemy alien. 
They were not permitted to serve their country, no matter how patriotic they might be. After December 7, Japan declared we were not Japanese. America said our loyalty was suspect. Our army said, we don't trust you, you know. But the war was not always going well for the United States and its allies. Western Europe was still held tight in Hitler's iron grip. The Japanese empire stretched from China and Indochina to the Philippines and the East Indies with forays into Alaska. After their first year in the camps, all internees over 18 were required to fill out a loyalty questionnaire issued by the government. Two questions were painfully controversial. One asked, will you swear allegiance to the United States and forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? The internees reasoned that answering yes to this question would be admitting an allegiance to Japan they never had. The second question asked, are you willing to bear arms to defend the United States? This puzzled the Nisei. How could they serve in the armed forces when they were still classified 4C? Then late in 1942, Elmer Davis, director of the Office of War Information, recommended to the president that Japanese Americans be allowed to enlist for military service. The Nisei were reclassified. Signs were posted in the mainland internment camps. The same appeal was made to the Nisei of Hawaii, where there were no camps. On the day I departed from the family, I left the family home to become a soldier. My father said, this country has been good to you. If it means you must give your life for it, so be it, but do so with honor. And uh, then he said, whatever you do, do not dishonor the family or the country. He did not use the word honor itself, but it meant the same. He said, don't bring shame upon us. On February 1st, 1943, President Roosevelt activated the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. The president stated, Americanism is not and never was a matter of race and ancestry. Honolulu gave its initial Nisei volunteers a grand send-off at Iolani Palace. The army had asked for 1,500 volunteers. 10,000 responded. The Nisei were highly motivated. First, to show that their loyalties were always to the United States. And they asked themselves, if we hang back and do nothing, what will become of us when the war ends? My parents found out that here my brother and I had volunteered. And you ought to see all hell broke loose. The people start saying, what's the matter with you people here? You claim you're an American citizen, and you're no better than we are. You're in the same camp that we are, and now you're saying you're going to volunteer. And you have parents in Japan. What are they going to say? And my thought was, I, I told him, I says, you know, the reason why we're here is that we don't have any past record where the Nihonjins or Japanese could prove their loyalty. Now's our chance. And if we don't take this chance and do something about it, it's going to be our fault. And, you know, some of us are not going to come back. But, you know, if that will... <laughs> In May of 43, Nisei from the mainland and Nisei from Hawaii were brought together for basic training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi, as the new 442nd RCT. Adopting the motto, Go For Broke, they could now march in the steps of the 100th Infantry Battalion. By October of that year, the Army was accepting Nisei women into the Women's Army Corps, the WACs. 
more than 300 Japanese American women joined up. They also volunteered as army nurses. At Camp Shelby, the unexpected happened. The fledgling 442nd's fighting spirit turned in on itself. Though they took well to the rigors of basic training, the Nisei rookies became polarized. Those from Hawaii and the mainlanders. Yeah, the faces are all Asian, but their languages are different, as we found out very shortly. Because, you know, we had a mixture of Hawaiian boys and mainland boys. Hawaii's Nisei charged the mainlanders with being stuck up. One of the reasons they didn't like the mainland guys is because they represented all the things that they didn't like in a plantation owner. They hated plantation owners. And anybody that even resembled or looked like or acted like a plantation owner, they didn't like. They were going to be against that. And I had all the attributes of plantation owner, and so they hated me. Hostilities between Hawaii's Nisei and the mainlanders came to the attention of the top brass. I recall Colonel Pence, the commanding officer of the 442nd, calling out the entire group. Uh, and he expressed his, his, uh, his alarm at the friction between the Hawaiian boys and the mainland boys. And what he brought it down to was, if you, you boys can't get along here together, here in Mississippi, you know, how the hell are you going to fight together when you get out in combat? A way had to be found to unify the manpower of the battalion, and it was. Chaplain Yamada finally decided that maybe these Hawaii boys better go to Jerome and Roar and see where their parents are and where they came from, why they volunteered from this relocation camps. It was arranged for the 442nd to pay a visit to the internment camps in neighboring Arkansas. The Nisei from Hawaii, where they had no internment camps, wanted to make an outing of it. So here we are with our ukuleles and guitars, if you can picture that, and we're singing all the way from Mississippi to Arkansas. But when we got closer, and we turned into it, then we began to realize what was happening. You see all the, uh, the buildings, but around the building, huge, tall barbed wire fence, and, and you know, they had guard tower with machine gun facing toward the camp. The men who were manning the guns were Caucasian men. They had rifles with bayonets, and here we were with ukuleles. Then we trooped in. There you could see men and women and children of Japanese ancestry. The people there had set aside one week's ration of food so that they could give us a party. We tried our best to be happy, but how can you be happy in those circumstances? Taking money the hard-earned money that they can use someplace else. They were, they were doing this for the, for the uh, GIs that came from Mississippi for us. And you know, we feel so guilty. As they met uh, uh, some of the boy's parents, the guy that he just licked and had a fight with, uh, they came back very somber and very, very quiet in the bus. They weren't playing the ukulele and singing song. And I believe that what was running through the minds of most, if not all, was a question, would I have volunteered from that camp? The differences between Hawaii's Nisei and the mainlanders were overcome by that experience. They were truly a team now and going for broke. By June of 1944, the men of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team were on their way to Italy, where they'd connect with the 100th Infantry Battalion. The 100th boys are delighted to see them at the first moment. Then they berate them and kick them, and, and in a sense, 
beat the hell out of them. I thought I told you to never come over here. What made you do such a stupid thing? Why can't you listen to me? See, so. The 100th Infantry Battalion is assigned to the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, but allowed to keep its unique designation as the 100th. Rome had fallen to the Allies. Hitler's forces were being driven farther and farther north. The closer the Allies got to Germany, the more fiercely the Germans fought to protect their homeland. By the end of June, the untested 442nd with the battle-savvy 100th were ordered into combat near Belvedere in northern Italy. The Germans were strong there. In a daring maneuver, the 100th went around Belvedere and surprised the enemy. Eventually, the pressure from uh, our 2nd and 3rd Battalion and the 100th, who had just really blasted the German force there uh, in one afternoon. Enemy casualties were high. 170 killed, two tanks, 50 vehicles, and artillery captured, and 40 prisoners taken. For its action at Belvedere, the 100th was awarded the Distinguished Presidential Unit Citation by General Mark Clark. Few Americans of Japanese descent have a right to be proud. The 34th Division is proud of you. The 5th Army is proud of you. America is proud of you. We have demonstrated true Americanism and true American citizenship on the field of battle. You have another right to be proud, for you have reached the high standards of American fighting men. Good luck to you, and God bless you. Before the war was over, the 100th Infantry Battalion with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team earned a total of seven presidential unit citations, the highest honor for a military unit. The Vosges Mountains are the spine of northeastern France. Nearby, the legendary River Rhine forms a border between France and Germany. It is to this part of France still held by Hitler's forces that the 442nd is shipped. Orders were to take the town of Briere, which held the key road supplying the German military in France. Enemy resistance was fierce, for Hitler had commanded his forces to hold their ground, whatever the cost. For several weeks, men of the 442nd inched their way over the punishing terrain toward their objective. Fighting was intense. Casualties soared. After one final push, they liberated the town of Briere. The men were exhausted. They had put everything into this mission. They had earned a long rest, but rest was not to be. During the fighting, a battalion of Texans was cut off and isolated from its regiment. Surrounded by an SS division, the Texans found themselves trapped. The balance of their regiment attacked desperately to rescue them without success. It seemed that nothing or no one could break through. Word of the Texans' plight reached the U.S. press, which quickly dubbed them the Lost Battalion. Pressures were mounting to make a rescue no matter what the odds. Rescue became a public relations imperative as well as a military necessity. General John Dahlquist had the responsibility of seeing that the lost battalion was rescued. Some have determined that the course of action Dahlquist decided upon jeopardized his own troops. 
After only one day of rest, the general commanded that the fatigued 442nd get back in line and carry out the rescue of the lost battalion. Why the 442nd? There were other regiments the general could have chosen, regiments that were fully rested. Why choose the Nisei who had just fought so hard and long? Could it be that they were more expendable than Caucasian troops? That the newspaper readers back home wouldn't count the cost as much? There was some question of whether we were expendable and so far as he was concerned, or whether we were good fighters. But I think it's the, the former. In any case, the young Nisei believed that if they succeeded in this mission, no one would ever again doubt their loyalty. Repulsing numerous enemy attacks, they trudged toward their goal for three days. The loss of life was staggering. But they were rewarded. They broke through and rescued the lost battalion. 211 unshaven, bedraggled Texans who had been without food or water for seven days. They were expecting tall Caucasians, but most of their rescuers weren't much over five feet. They, they didn't like little people. They looked like giants to us, and they were. They shook our hands and, and uh, thanked us and everything, and some of them says, oh, I'm glad to see you Japs, you know. And I know he didn't mean it that way, but that's what he just said. He just came out, found out that uh, uh, Oh, there was only 230 survived that uh, surrounding, and uh, we uh, uh, decided, well, golly, 230, but we lost 800 uh, tr trying to make this uh, rescue. And so it was a terrible price that we paid, you know. The lost battalion was rescued. General Dahlquist commanded that all the men of the 442nd assemble in formation. As the able-bodied Nisei lined up, the general snapped at Lieutenant Colonel Miller. My command was that all of the men be assembled. Colonel Miller replied, yes, sir. All of the men are what you see. When it arrived in France, the 442nd had almost 3,000 men. Now, a month later, 2,000 had been killed or wounded. The Gothic Line. For six months, Allied forces had tried to breach this belt of German fortifications, minefields, and artillery emplacements. The Allied advance into northern Italy was blocked. In April of 45, the 442nd, its depleted ranks replenished by Nisei volunteers and draftees from the other side of the Atlantic, shipped out of the port of Marseille for a return trip to Italy. The Nisei Gopher Brokers were thrown against the Gothic. In a surprise attack on the enemy's mountainside position, the 442nd cracked the Gothic line and broke through in just one day. On the morning of the attack, Private Sadao Munimori single-handedly wiped out a pair of machine guns. When a grenade was lobbed next to two of his buddies, Munimori flung himself over it and took the blast with his own body. For his selfless action in battle, Private Munimori was awarded posthumously the Congressional Medal of Honor, which in the United States is the highest award for heroism. Although many others were recommended for this highest award, they were all turned down. The 100th Infantry Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team continued in the push north until the German army in Italy surrendered. Nisei soldiers crossed into Austria and then into Bavaria in Germany itself. Some units were approaching the village of Dachau nine miles northwest of Munich, when they came across the concentration camp. 
they were not prepared for what they saw. One of the greatest ironies of World War II happened there in Dachau when members of a persecuted minority, the Japanese Americans, many of whose families were still interned in the United States, reaching out to help members of another persecuted minority, the Jewish people of Europe. And what are our crimes? One for being Jewish and one for being Japanese. These liberating GIs, many of whom had been incarcerated themselves, were witnesses to the vast difference between the internment camps in the U.S. and the Nazi death camps, such as Dachau. May of 45, the German army surrendered. The war in Europe was won. On the 4th of July, the Nisei of the 100th Infantry Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team sailed into New York Harbor. A week and a half later, they were in Washington, D.C., where President Harry S. Truman awarded a presidential unit citation. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you've won. The president was sincere. But the battle against prejudice was not quite over. Had the president known of the heroic action under fire of some of these men, he might have insisted on an investigation into why they had not been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Hostilities had ceased in Europe, but the war still raged in the Pacific. One group of Nisei did serve in the Pacific and served well. Most of them were Kibei, meaning Japanese Americans whose immigrant parents had sent them to Japan to round out their education, to increase their Japanese language skill for one thing. But the Kibei, as Americans of Japanese descent, encountered discrimination in the old country too. As far as the Japanese were concerned, the Kibei were from another world. As U.S.-Japan hostilities escalated, the Army faced a need for personnel fluent in Japanese. The Kibei were recruited. Others volunteered. The War Department secretly opened a language school in San Francisco with four Japanese-American instructors. Fifty-eight of the 60 students were Nisei. This was the beginning of the MIS, the Military Intelligence Service. The MIS language school was moved from San Francisco far inland to Minnesota. They were the silent warriors, assigned in groups and sometimes as individuals to every branch of the armed forces, Army, Navy, Marines. Their activities were top secret monitoring Japanese radio broadcasts. And it wasn't so much how many Japanese soldiers you could kill, it's how many American soldiers you could save. Translating enemy messages. Interrogating prisoners of war. You're not supposed to be captured to be gone. That was the greatest dis disgrace, you know. A samurai warrior to be captured. If you're captured, you disembowel yourself. The MIS Japanese Americans became the eyes and ears of the Allies in the Pacific. Nisei of the MIS translated Japan's Z Plan, the Imperial Navy's defense strategy for the Marianas, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. General Douglas MacArthur said of the MIS, never in the history of combat has one side known so much about the enemy prior to actual battle and quoting MacArthur's intelligence chief. The MIS saved countless lives and shortened the war by two years. A short time ago, an American airplane 
dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. On August 14th, Japan surrendered. On September 2nd, we got up uh, to go out to Tokyo Bay to board Missouri. Being, with the la being a language officer for the press, I, it was a privilege to be escorted uh, just 30 feet subdeck of Battleship Missouri, 30 feet from the table. There's only one table on the deck. And in as much as the war was finally over, it was a joyous festive occasion. The Navy band played anchors away and everybody was shouting and you could see sailors all over the place. Finally, when uh, Colonel Mashbear, who was the commander of Addis in Brisbane, escorted uh, the Japanese delegation and there was dead silence. They were ushered to the mid-deck of Missouri. At that point, all the gaiety disappeared, and it was one of uh, cruel silence of animosity by the uh, sailors and military towards the Japanese delegation. And I thought then, and I repeat my recollection, that the nation, the people of Japan, was truly disgraced on the battleship Missouri that day. Some MIS Kibei and Nisei were stationed in post-war Japan, where they served at the war crimes trial in locating imprisoned Americans, in repatriating Japanese soldiers, and in rewriting Japan's constitution. They came back, the men of the 100th Infantry Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and their fame had preceded them. For their size and their short length of service, they came back one of the most decorated units in U.S. military history. They came back to rebuild their lives. Those returning to the mainland found that their families were in the process of being released from the camps. When I saw my father, we just grabbed each other and just danced in joy. I, I, you know, it was a funny thing. Yeah, we, right there, and I come home and he grabbed me and we're just jumping up and down. Some came back to find ugly old prejudices still alive and kicking. Shops wouldn't sell to them. Restaurants wouldn't serve them. It took 40 years for the U.S. government to deal that kind of prejudice a deadly blow. Congress passed Resolution Number 442, issuing a formal apology to Issei and Nisei internees of the camps for the government's actions during the Second World War. Congress also probed for reasons why the Congressional Medal of Honor had been withheld from so many deserving Asian Americans. Today we pay tribute to these extraordinary men and women, Japanese Americans who fought in World War II, served in the US Armed Services with this, the Go For Broke Monument. In June of 1999 in downtown Los Angeles, an impressive monument was unveiled engraved with the names of 16,000 Nisei soldiers and officers who served overseas, including 37 Japanese-American women. In June of 2000, the Nisei of the Military Intelligence Service received long overdue recognition, their own presidential citation. The medals awarded the Nisei military had been reviewed and upgraded from the Distinguished Service Cross to the highest award, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Rarely has a nation been so well served by a people it had so ill-treated. The Medal of Honor is awarded to Private Barney F. 
Hajiro for extraordinary heroism. 21 Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded. Seven of the recipients were still living, including Second Lieutenant Dan Inoue, now a distinguished United States Senator. I received approximately a dozen medals, but not because of heroics. In the heat of battle, you are not looking for medals. You are simply putting your whole life into fighting for your country. Looking back, we realize today how unjust America had been in the way it dealt with the citizens of Japanese ancestry during World War II. Yet I know of no other nation that would openly admit it had been wrong, as this nation had done, and then take steps to rectify that wrong. Only a truly great nation dares to risk making such an admission. This is the America that we fought for and died for.